Welcome to American Cannabis. I'm your host, Ella Smith, and this is sponsored by Cannabis Tech. Today we'll be speaking with Dr. Chernowski from Rad Source Technologies, where they have a product that is effective in mold, mildew, aspergillus, and pathogen remediation. Dr. Chernowski, welcome. It's great to have you on today. Thanks so much, Alice. Really, really glad to be here. It's very exciting. So, um, if you would please give me a little um, background on 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 who you are and what um, Rad Source Technologies is, and uh, this will kind of segue into the slideshow for our uh, our audience to kind of tune into. But if you would please give us a little background on you and your team and what you guys are doing at Rad Source Technologies. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, like I said, I'm Dr. Justin Chernowski. Um, you can call me Justin, that's fine. I got my uh, PhD in chemistry from the University of Georgia in 2015. I specialized in surface science, surface chemistry, and that kind of area really works in the solar industry, the battery industry, the fuel cell industry, and it really applied to our company. And, and so we we're kind of an innovator in the X-ray technology. And then the reason we talk about that is because you know, there hasn't really been a lot of innovation since X-ray was invented, and and we we really actually kind of consider ourselves in a class of our own. And and part of our presentation today is to talk about how we how our technology is the leading technology, and 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 why we have such an advantage over a lot of our competitors. And Great. in terms well, of the team, um, I've got Nathan Kroger here, who's our longest-running sales uh, manager. And I've got uh, Dustin Hughes, who's our account executive for cannabis. Uh, do you guys want to maybe talk a little bit about yourselves right now or wait until the question and answer? Sure. Um, as I pointed out, my name is Nathan Kroger. I've been with RadSource now for about 10 years. I've been working in this type of industry for about 14 years. Um, working with, uh, I come from the medical device side where we worked with contract sterilization and uh, validation. So I'm very familiar with microbial remediation. And uh, I'm really grateful to be here. Thank you. Hi, my name is Dustin Hughes. Uh, I've been in cannabis now for almost 10 years. Uh, everything from uh, a grower to designer of facilities and uh, working with dry cure labs, hydrocarbon labs, and um, uh, really all aspects of uh, growing cannabis. Well, it's pretty neat to be to be having a, a phone call with some boys out of Georgia. I'm from Alabama, and so it's neat to see some Southern guys getting into the space now and being exposed to the industry as a whole as we're really seeing it take off uh, across the globe. So I uh, need to see that uh, a company like you guys in in, uh, in Georgia is uh, tackling a, an industry like this where it's not necessarily um, looked upon in a, in a bright light in your state, let's just say. <laughs> so. Pretty neat to see you guys are breaking down those barriers and still pursuing this. So pretty neat. Yeah. So and and, and it's really cool. Um, we actually didn't really start in the cannabis business. We we started in the medical device uh, business. So we have one FDA approved machine, which is our blood irradiator. Uh, we'll talk. You know. And 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 so we just so happened to find that our technology really worked in this industry. Uh, we've been around since ninety nine, ninety seven, and uh, I've been with the company now almost four years. And so we have a lot of experience uh, with high-quality, uh, medical-grade stuff that we've then taken that technology and now integrated into this growing market. Well, that's pretty neat. Well, if you want to go ahead and dive into the slideshow, let's kick this off. And I'm excited to learn more about your tech, and I'm sure our audience is as well. And um, as we get through this, uh, we'd love to encourage our audience to please uh, send us any type of questions you have. Uh, we will stop during the um, slideshow if we need to to answer the question, and if uh, not, we may wait and save these to the end. So uh, please shoot us any questions that you have. We're monitoring it in real time. So I appreciate it again, Ellis, and uh, like I said, today we're going to be talking about remediation and decontamination. And, you know, a lot of people, they, they just, they have a real hard time passing their state tests, and, and we're here to fix that. And, you know, growing up in Georgia, I, I pretty much lived in Georgia all my life. I don't know if it's the demographic or what, but there's this commercial you constantly hear on the radio where, you know, the older demographic, I think, uh, may have some problems. And so there's this, this radio commercial that says uh, there's a secret in the bedroom that everybody knows about but nobody talks about. And I was at a few con cannabis conferences, uh, especially the latest one in, in New Orleans, 
and we, we held a, a panel on remediation and, and mold, mildew, fungus issues, and not a lot of people are, are willing to admit that they've got those problems. So, that you know, the big problems in the industry, uh, there's a secret, but nobody talks about it. And you, you've got things like, uh, you know, b uh, botrytis. You've got uh, powdery mildew, things like that. There's, there's all kinds of issues. And, and the worst of all is that aspergillus. So, you know, we, we really want to try to help these people, uh, you know, especially growers, save their product. And so there's a couple different ways to help prevent and remediate these kind of things. So you can the preventative aspect of it is to is to use grow technology. It's it, you know making sure your building construction is uh, you know hermetic and that you've got uh, you know all kinds of maybe clean room type tactics of, of entry and exit, trying to make sure that people don't bring anything in from the outside world. Worst case scenario, you do have an outbreak. You can always go to extraction. Uh, extraction is, is a method, but a lot of people really do want to save their flowers, so we, we really focused on the remediation aspect of it. You do have an outbreak, and how do you want to remediate that? There's a few different ways. There's chemical, which is things like ozones, chlorides, uh, chlorine dioxide, and then ethylene oxide. We'll talk a little bit about those, and then there's radiation in terms of remediation. You've got things like RF and microwave. You've got infrared. You've got UV. You've got X-ray, and then you've got gamma. And so kind of to, talk, to start, you know, we can talk a little bit about chemical treatment. There's a few different types, like I talked about. There's the ozone, there's the chlorines, and, and there's the ethylene oxides. But and I, I kind of got some problems with those, and, well, well, wait a minute. So, hey, come on. Are you really – you're going to take everything? And the, the problem – well, this is it. This is the drawbacks. The drawbacks are they, they rob you of everything. Uh, they, they literally wipe everything out. They're kind of a nuclear option when it comes to your remediation technique. And, and what do I mean by that? Well, they, they, they don't focus on any particular uh, species. They, they attack everything. They'll attack your, your cannabinoids. They'll attack your physical structure of your, of your cannabis. They'll attack the terpenes, all the things that you really like that you're trying to use in terms of making your product sellable. And to kind of prove that, a lot of these chemical compounds are used in things like hotel sterilization. So if you've ever walked into a home hotel room and it's got that kind of funky after smell or maybe a little bit of residual smoke smell that just qu couldn't quite get out, that's kind of your chemical effect right there. Is it, you're, you're really only as as effective as the line of sight. And, and I'll talk a little bit about what that means uh, because if you can't attack it, you can't get it. So there's a little bit of residual. It's also used in things like uh, rental cars. So you know, if somebody smokes in a rental car and, and leaves that behind, they'll ozone blast it or use some sort of oxidizing agent on it and try to get all that smell out. And like I said, you know, your, your reliability with this, these techniques, these type of chemical techniques is a little shaky at best. It's a, it's, it's a real difficult balancing act very difficult. It's, it's tough to tune chemicals, um, and the big thing is that it's based on line of sight. And when, when I talk about line of sight, I, I use this picture right here, where you have a guy, and he has two, two enemies. You know, one's standing behind a tree, and the other one's out in the open. And it's much easier for the guy to attack the guy out in the open than the guy behind the tree. So in our scenario, let's change things, right? Your attacker is your, your oxidizing agent, right? And your tree, in this case, is the stuff you like, your cannabinoids, your terpenes, your THCs, your, your actual structure of your species. And then your, your bad guys are, are your, your mold, right, your aspergillus. And so if there's not direct access or a line of sight access to your mold, mildew, and fungus, you're going to have a hard time specifically targeting those products. And so that's, that's kind of one of the major drawbacks to this technique. You know, if you leave it in too long, it's going to attack too much of your terpenes and your cannabinoids, and if you don't leave it in long enough, you're not going to get that remediation effect to the extent that you want it. You also are not completely killing everything, so your, your possibility of putting it back in your bag and, and things continuing to grow is actually really highly probable. The other big drawback is actually just the fact that they're chemicals, and chemicals come with chemical hazards. So you have things like uh, ingestion hazards, you know, hazards to people, you have hazards to nature, um, you have corrosive hazards, carcinogenic hazards, explosive hazards, and fire hazards. And the crazy thing is, is that these five uh, symbols are actually the com combination of all of those oxidizers that you saw and the ethylene oxide that you saw in the last 
applied. So all five of these apply to either most of them or some of the uh, of the species you see. So there's added cost in terms of preparing your facility for chemicals, chemical waste disposal, chemical ventilations, uh, you know, protecting your 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 employees as well. So then the other the other style that we like to talk about is is the electro is the electromagnetic spectrum. And the reason we like to talk about this is because there are a few different options on this spectrum is on, on, on the electromagnetic spectrum. You've got radio wave, microwave, infrared, visible, ultraviolet, X-ray, and gamma. And, and right now I'm going to actually focus on kind of the low energy side of this spectrum, which is radio wave, microwave, and infrared. So that's kind of your typical ways to, to remediate. The mechanism in this area is actually not directly affecting your um, – your, your molds, it's actually affecting the water molecules within your flower. So, you know, radio wave, microwave, infrared, they cause vibrations, rotations, and, and, and all kinds of different stretches that these water molecules like to do. And much like if you go to the gym and you work out, you get hot, you start putting off heat, sweating and all that stuff, water acts very similar. So you hit them with these radio waves, these microwaves, they start vibrating, they create a lot of heat. But that really means that your mechanism is very dependent on the water content of your of your of your flower. So you know if you don't have a lot of water or or the water is evenly kind of displaced within your samples, then you're not going to really get the effect you're looking for. And, and also just in general, you know everybody has or I don't know maybe it's just me. Uh, you know people have always put food in the microwave and it never quite tastes the same as when it's cooked fresh. It's got a little bit more of a rubbery taste, maybe a little bit more dry, or even you get that uneven heating, especially in your hot pockets, you know, if you're a Jim Gaffigan fan. And so <laughs> the whole thing the whole thing about, uh, you know, equilibrium of water within your system is, is very dependent on the mechanisms in this kind of area. So it, it, it's really, it, it's a little shaky, like I said, in the reliability. It also causes that heat. That, that the mechanism, that heat mechanism, also causes premature decarboxylation of your THCA. So you're actually pre-activating your THC, you know, before you're getting a chance. So you know that that's a volatile compound. It does go away over time. So you don't really want to try to activate that until as late in the process as you can. Um, so that's kind of that part of the spectrum. The other part of the spectrum is the ionizing radiation part of the spectrum, and there's a lot of stuff. To learn about this part of the spectrum, especially in terms of misconceptions. So, really, visible light doesn't do much in terms of affecting molecules or, or atoms or anything like that. And to a certain extent, ultraviolet doesn't either. But when you start get to the high end of ultraviolet, and especially into the X-ray and the gamma ray section, you start getting into what's called ionizing radiation. And ionizing radiation actually physically breaks bonds. It's it's a completely different mechanism than that lower energy part of the spectrum that I talked about. And you can see in the little, you know, GIF I've got below that you're, when you're hitting things like DNA strands with, with X-ray or gamma ray, then you're actually physically breaking the strand apart. And that's, that's real death when it comes to things like single-celled uh, organism. You, you actually are physically stopping it from being able to reproduce ever. So you really don't have a chance of anything growing back. And the nice part about it is it's so... Uh, its ability to penetrate through things like containers, so plastic bags and stuff like that, you can actually seal up your product, irradiate it in the bag, kill everything in it, and not have to reopen it and, and risk your chance of re-exposure to any kind of contamination parts, uh, any kind of contamination aspects of it. There are a few drawbacks that we can talk about. So ultraviolet, it's very low energy, uh, which basically translates to inefficiency. It doesn't penetrate very well into your into your product. It's very similar to that line of sight mechanism uh, that we talked about with the gases. So the gases themselves have to have a clear and visible angle to get to to get to the actual uh, thing you want to kill. Well, ultraviolet, you know, it's it's pretty much loose. It's lost its energy as soon as as it hits something. So you really don't get that penetrative effect. It's it's okay in things like preventative measures, especially when you're trying to like clean air. But even that mechanism is pretty slow. So it's it's it, especially when you incorporate it into your grow technology, you just have to be aware that um, it, it's going to take a lot of UV light and very strategically placed UV light 
for you to get a real effect from, from UV. The biggest, the other thing we want to talk about is gamma. And so gamma is actually currently what's being used in some Scandinavian countries in Canada as kind of their, uh, they almost require it as their protocol in, in terms of decontamination uh, when, it, when it comes to these remediation type things. But there's some huge drawbacks to gamma. The most important thing is that it comes from a radioactive decay uh, and so that's an, that's an active isotope source, and, and active isotope sources, especially post 9/11, are, are really becoming not only very expensive to maintain and operate, but there's a there's a terrorism hazard. There's just there's just so much of the government that's involved in that process. It, it's really not something you want to get into. And in, and in fact, the governments are actively going after these sources, trying to remove them out of production. Uh, and in replacing them with equivalent technologies. That's why our blood irradiator has done so well. We've, uh, we've actually been able to go into a lot of these facilities that have used gamma for so long and replace them with an X-ray equivalent, which is basically a light bulb. You know, you turn it off, it's off. You turn it on, it's on. Where, whereas when you have a, a gamma source, a radioactive source, you cannot turn that off at all. It's, it always has to be shielded. You have to have security around it all the time. When it comes to X-ray, the big, the big problems with that are, are confusion and just across ionizing radiation in general. There's a lot of confusion about what radiation means. A lot of people have a negative connotation to that. You think of turning into the Hulk or something like that, but it's really not. Uh, it's it's really kind of a misconception about the technology. You're you're not going to turn on your emitter and you're not going to open the door and the radiation is going to flood out on you, you know, the energy dissipates over time. It goes into the lead shielding that we used. It goes into the product itself. So that energy is dissipated. It's not, it doesn't stay forever. In fact, it's very short-lived. And in X-ray in particular, the biggest problem has been the lack of innovation. Just innovation in general in that area has been very slow. Uh, the X-ray tube was invented in something like the 1800s, and, real, and realistically, there has been no leaps and bounds in that technology, uh, you know, since then. But Radsource Technologies, which was, like I said, like uh, Nathan said, founded in '97, did come up with an innovative X-ray design. And in fact, we we don't call our our source an X-ray source; we call it an X-ray emitter. And that technology is actually this Quasar technology. And so Quasar technology. The logo looks like that because instead of our emitters being directional and very limited in scope, we actually put off x-rays in every direction. So we can do very unique and fun geometries with our products and, and, and the samples that we want to put around our, our, our emitter and, and have a highly effective uh, delivery of, of x-ray and, and a very uh, efficient delivery of x-ray. And, and because of that, we are the leading uh, innovation in X-ray technology by far. Uh, we have a patented system; uh, it's 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 extremely unique. Um, the the efficiency of the photons, uh, basically, for the same amount of energy, you actually get photon average average energies photons that are actually higher. They look, you know, where our competitors would have to go to a higher energy level to get the same kind of equivalent X-rays that we get with our emitter, just based on the design. And like, I, and like I was talking with Ellis about at the beginning, you know, we actually started in the blood industry. We started as a medical device company, uh, you know, from, almost from the get-go. Uh, we're also in cancer research. We have small animal irradiators. We have cell irradiators. And a, a big one that, our, that one of our, um, our kind of co-founders is always proud of is our sterile insect technique, which is uh, you basically can take male insects, sterilize them, release them into the population, and it controls the bug population. So we take those same principles and those same standards that we do for our FDA-approved medical device, and we actually implement those in all of our systems. So we, you're really getting a high-quality system from a company that really does care about that kind of quality. And the nice thing about it is, unlike gamma sources, where you have to have security and the National Guard bring in your source and all that stuff, we actually are treated like a dental x-ray machine. So if you've ever been to the dentist, you're not, you know, I know some of, some people are scared to go to the dentist, but, you know, it's not, you know a lot of people aren't. And uh, when you get your mouth x-rayed, you know, you, you walk away fine. You know, it's, the, it's the same. It's treated as a similar type of device as, as the dental x-ray machine does. Um, and like I said, you know, the, the biggest thing is the, the technology is proven. It's been proven in terms of ionizing radiation. 
you know, it, it, it remediates the microbials. The wavelength of it is, is specifically tuned to attack, most, to attack only the DNA. It's too small to attack your terpenes, to attack your cannabinoids, to attack the actual physical presence of your, of your flower. It, it goes right to that DNA, right to those single cell organisms. And, like, and it's been used in Canada and the Netherlands, and, and it's been for the last, you know, decade. So it, it, it's not something – we're not reinventing the wheel. We're just taking the application and, and trying to make it more accessible to everybody. But the proof is in the pudding, right? You know, we can talk all day, and, and, and I, even though, you know, I, I, I give a decent presentation, I'm a tech guy, I'm, I'm not a salesman, so the proof to me is always in the pudding. And uh, this is an example from a, from a customer of, of their product. And, and actually, one of these has been treated with our photonic decontamination technique and the other hasn't. And what's amazing, if you look at this picture, is you, you really cannot tell physically the difference between the two. You know, in reality, the one on the left was pre-treatment and the one on the right was post-treatment. And this isn't the only example. We've got multiple examples of before and after photonic de decontamination treatments. In this case, the one on the left was post-treatment and the one on the right was pre-treatment. You don't see any physical change, something that you might have to watch out for when you use a chemical agent. All right, but let's look at the stats. Let's look at the real numbers, okay? So in this case, we had uh, a customer who was trying out our machine, and they didn't, uh, you know, they, they decided they were going to try their own protocol, and they were already pretty low on their mold, mildew, and yeast. They, they passed in that regard, but they had some problems with their aerobic bacteria and their microbial growth. So we consider, you know, 1,000 gray or so, about half of a dose irradiated. Uh, you know, we, we see people ranging anywhere from total doses of 1,500 gray to about 2,000 gray, and it kind of depends on how dirty your product starts out. Well, you can see, but just with a half dose, the microbial level dropped to a passing, to a passing level. So these guys will pass their tests. Um, no doubt about it. <clears throat> the other, the other really fun um, slide we like to show is is this one from a California grow lab, where on the left side the picture shows two petri dishes. One is an inoculated petri dish, so that's one that's been purposely doped with aspergillus, and the right side is from their actual product themselves, and they went through the PCR, grew the they grew the mold and the mild, they, they grew the aspergillus, and, and this is their results. Well, then they took the same, they took, you know, new petri dishes. They they inoculated the one side. They took their plant swab. They inoculated, or they, you know, they swabbed it in the in the other petri dish. They then irradiated it, and they went through the same PCR procedure, and nothing grew. Nothing grew. So it it got rid of it all. And what they found was that their cannabinoid profiles. Uh, were within the standard deviation of the treatment, meaning they're basically limited by their measurement technique. Their terpene profiles, their moisture profiles were all within the standard deviation of their, of their actual technique. And again, you know, a customer, they were so impressed that they actually put this slide together for us with all of the different information. And so uh, you can see things like the cannabinoid uh, content where you see very little drop. In fact, the, the drop that they see, they attributed to the fact that it was just out in the air, that, that the time frame that it was, uh, that it was uh, between harvest and between testing would account for that drop in the, in the levels. They, they had nothing to do, there was no effect from the, from the ionizing, from the X-ray radiation. Same with the terpene levels. The terpene levels were, this, were, this, were within the standard deviation, didn't, didn't drop. Moisture content also didn't change. So we're not affecting the flower at all. We really truly are tuned to, those, to that DNA, to that very small um, kind of those small invasive species, and we leave the real big uh, good molecules alone, and that's, and that's really cool. And you can see here, too, um, on the uh, HPLC that, you know, the profile didn't change at all before and after. You're still seeing the same peaks before and after, meaning there was actually no physical change in any of the structures. So it didn't change the potency, didn't change the aroma of the flower. Um, they all passed their aspergillus testing, uh, and, 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 and that was just a really fun slide for us to get, especially when it comes from your customer.
So all of these studies, all these treatments, they show the same thing. You know, we have an independent lab that has done some testing for us, and, and all their conclusions come up to is it doesn't cause any significant change to the content of the CHC or the CBD. And obviously those are the most important parts of your product. I mean, that's the, that's the medicinal part, the therapeutic part of your, of your product. So you don't want to affect those, and, and I think most people agree with that. Uh, you know, likewise, the water content. The water content of the dried, of the dried um, product was not affected at all. So it's very, very, very fun to see those kind of results. So overall, we have this 420 line. So, you know, our machines are always have numbers, and we figured 420 was the most appropriate for the series. And as, as a whole, they, they, don't, they don't heat the flower at all. So there's no added heat to the process. They don't saturate the flower with any kind of disinfectants. So you're not going to be pumping a room or a chamber or anything full of chemicals, and you're not going to have to worry about dealing with your chemical safety or anything like that. Uh, we, do, we use a, a very short wavelength, so a very small wavelength uh, emitter. It, it's tuned kind of right in that area to affect only the DNA. And it's it's a similar technology to the to the stuff they're using in Can in Canada and the Netherlands. You know, and, and Canada's got it uh, legalized throughout the country. So they know, you know, they're kind of the pioneers. And the United States is actually we're seeing a lot of state regulators taking a lot of um, pages out of the Canadian book because they've been doing it. Um, and 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 so th so it's not it's not like we're reinventing the technology. We're just making it safe. Uh, and, and we have three different models to kind of suit your needs, and, and that's what's really nice about RadSource, uh, about RadSource's emitter. It allows us to kind of put different configurations together to suit your needs. And the three, the three main ones that we have are what we call the 420M line, which is our smallest unit. We typically use this unit to kind of proof, prove to people that our technology works, um, or if you're a very small batch grower, you can use this technology to your advantage. Um, it, it runs about one to two-ish pounds per cycle, and the cycle time typically takes about three hours. Um, and again, it depends kind of on your, on your, how dirty your product is. So we've seen, you know, less. We've seen, I don't think we've seen much more than that. Uh, and it's a single chamber system. Um, it does pass your, y you will pass your, your state testing with it. I mean, it's, it's, it, it works. Our middle, I have a question. Middle. I have a question real quick. I don't mean to interrupt, but I've got a question for you on this. Yeah. Um, now, let's say you, you do have um, PM pretty bad or botrytis, and it's very visible to the eye. Mm -hmm. um, and you do put it in your machine, and what actually happens to that to the visual powdery mildew or that black mold botrytis? Is it still visible, or does your technology take away that visual aspect to it as well? So the good and bad. This is Nathan Kroger. The good and bad of our product is we do, or of our process is we don't change the product. If it goes in looking a certain way, it's going to come out looking the same way. The only difference okay. is it won't it, it, you won't get any microbial growth in any plating or PCR. Okay, understood. So you, you'll 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 pass all the testing, but from a visual standpoint, aesthetically, you're not going to get that bag of pill, curb appeal, the market that's going to question it, even though it still may have passed testing. Correct. That is correct. Yep. Okay. And, and that's that's the real advantage of using our product is it it doesn't change um, the product. So if your product looks great, but for whatever reason can't pass the microbial testing, using our product it will pass it. You know, because I, I, that's one of the big concerns we talk to people all the time. They say we can't pass, but you, you know, look at our product. It's fantastic. It, it, it's great. So we allow them to do that. Okay. I'm cool. sure there are other. Sorry to interrupt there. So yeah, I, I just no, had, no, had a quick no, question no. that popped in. Yeah. No problem at all. Uh, and, and you know the the big thing, I did miss this part. Uh, you know we're we're kind of coming towards more of the end of the con of the presentation. I wanted to keep it to like a thirty to forty five minute ish presentation with the fifteen minute questions. And one of the things I did miss is 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 growers have got to be aware that the FDA doesn't regulate cannabis, and so you have to be very very suspicious when a company tells you that their device, their marijuana device, is FDA regulated. You know, we, we never claim that our device is an FDA-approved device. We have one FDA-approved device. It's our blood irradiator. We're very proud of it. We still take that technology and implement it in our other units. But a lot of people have been giving uh, a lot of misconception over, 
the FDA, for some reason, they, they're, they're telling people the FDA is, is approving their device for marijuana use, and, and the FDA has no jurisdiction. It's federally illegal. It doesn't, doesn't make sense. So that is something to kind of watch when you're, when you're looking at competitive technology. Um, but, the, but this middle-sized this middle, um, unit, which is, which is our, we call it just our, our regular 420, uh, we, this one does about five pounds or so per cycle, and, and the cycle time is typically about three, three hours. It's got a multiple canister configuration and a rotation method around our emitter that's actually patented. So we've protected that movement around our, our, our emitter, and, and it gives us an advantage in terms of quantity. And the last one is our largest unit, and we call it the XL. And this one uses, uh, they're about 12 inch in diameter by 26 inch tall tubes. And you basically can fit a, about two, two five pound bags of, of, of product per tube, and there's five tubes. So it's about 50 pounds, you know, depending on your density uh, of product per cycle. And a cycle time can range between five and seven hours, again, depending on the, the cleanliness of your product. Uh, but it does have that multiple canister feature to it. So it's, it's a really nice kind of larger throughput type, type addition to our family. And, uh, and, and we've had companies come out and buy multiples of these when, when they're getting to be the real big, the big guys, uh, you know, three, four, five of these things to really process their materials. So, you know, if the big guys are doing it and you want to keep up, you know, we really suggest, you know, looking into the technology. Um, kind of summarizes really my talk. I, I kind of hit the number I was looking for in terms of, of length. Um, I, I'd be happy to open up, Ellis, to questions if there was anything that we kind of want to cover. Sure, we've got a handful from um, our audience, and then um, we'll start with those, and I'm sure I'll have a few I want to throw in there as well. Sure. Um, is, is your product registered in the EU? Um, and do you have any interest to sell it in the EU for cannabis treatment? It sounds like you, you do have it in Canada as well as in the Netherlands. Is that correct, or is that a different technology? Uh, it's the same same um, process, different technology. So they're using okay. gamma, uh, we're using X-ray, um, but it's the same same process. Uh, just the difference is that we're we're using lower energy, so ours can be self shielded, much safer to be around. We actually have some customers who have it installed ten feet from their desk because they're safe enough to be around. Uh, to the question of do we have do we sell into the EU, we have. We are an international company. We have products worldwide. Um, we have a dealer who's great uh, that, that handles all of Europe. He lives in the uh, UK, I believe, and uh, he'd be happy to provide pricing for you. Um, pricing varies based on uh, the, the dealer who's handling it. But uh, if you want to reach out to us through our, our Contact Us portal on our website, we'd be happy to provide that pricing for you. Perfect. Okay, here's another question for you. Um, how does that affect foreign matter testing if the physical mold or mildew is still present, even if safe? So I think we kind of just discussed that, but if you want to touch on that one more time just for this person, then maybe they missed us discussing that earlier. So when you, when you ask foreign matter testing, are you talking about um, for PCR for, um, uh, to look to see if there's DNA present? Yeah, I'm not getting any more details on that question, so I'm not sure. So if that's the question, then um, our equipment works on DNA whether it's alive or dead. And we've, we've, our customers have, have consistently given us feedback that um, whether it's been, whether they test it via plating or whether they test it via PCR method, um, it, 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 it works either way, whether the bacteria has been killed or not. I, I'm sorry. Whether it's been killed with our treatment or with another treatment, um, our equipment will clear out the DNA either way. Here's a question. I mean, we, you, you kind of show this through your pictures, but they're really getting down to the actual, um, the, the very details of the, of the bud structure. So I'll ask this question here and let's see if you can answer it. So I said, do you have any pre or post microscopic images to see if any changes to the trichrome structure were uh, affected at all? I guess they just want to get a little more granular. Sure, the pictures you show it doesn't really show any discoloration or change, but they're wanting to know if you have any microscopic pictures of trichromes that may have lost their mushroom heads or may have, um, I don't know, turned colors or something. I'm not sure. But have you seen anything like that? So um, 
We have not seen any changes. Um, we can get pictures from our customers. So if there's something in particular that they're looking for, again, if they want to submit us a, a request through our website, we'd be happy to, to go get that information and provide it to them. I've never been asked for that, to be honest. Um, the people who've looked at the product, all of our customers say it works great and it doesn't affect the product. So I can't imagine that at a microscopic level it's any different, but we can certainly provide that information. Okay. Um, and, and I want to ask this question too, and I hate to ask this, and you may or may not want to provide this, and, but what is the price of the machine someone's asking? And I was thinking the same thing. And if you don't want to disclose that, I understand. Make us reach out to you and get that independently, but if you're willing to give that up, I think it may be some insight for our audience. Yeah, so we, as we pointed out, we have three different units. The, the price ring ranges from about $100,000 to, to $340,000, depending on the way the unit is configured and uh, some of the accessories that might go with it. Okay. And what, and, what, and what size was that Was that for again? Um, that's for all three sizes. That's what I'm saying is if you go from the smallest unit – to the largest unit, the, the range is anywhere from 100000 up to 340000 yeah, So we, okay. we would need to talk with you just to find out, for the, with the customer to find out which configuration they'd want um, so we could price it accurately. Well, if, if you look at that, just answering that question alone for these people, that if you're running a 2 or $3 million cultivation facility a year, and let's say you're, you're almost guaranteed a 5% loss from just contamination, you kind of build that into your model, these machines will make up for that, and really, uh, m some people are even have a higher loss than that. Sometimes, ten or fifteen percent right. you're seeing consistently, and so um, the technology right. itself will, will will pay for itself year after year. Um, how how are warranties with this, and how do you guys um, maintain the the maintenance and the upkeep of these things, and ensuring that they're still um, you know calibrated properly and uh, aren't aren't uh, are, is not doing its job, I guess. So how do you guys manage that that part of the relationship? So um, let me address the, the first thing you'd mentioned on uh, the return on investment. Um, one of our customers in Massachusetts, um, they had they did not have any microbial um, problems, but they had a big investor come in, gave them some money. So they thought, well, they're going to uh, preactively invest in the equipment. They bought it, and then they accidentally. Um, brought some powdery mildew into their facility that contaminated all their flour. Uh, they were able to save that entire harvest and sell it as flour with our equipment. The equipment paid for itself on the very first harvest. Um, we also have a, a customer out in Nevada that um, he was losing up to 20% of his product. Um, when I say losing, he wasn't able to sell it as flour. I'm sure he was still extracting it. When he started using our equipment, he went from 20% loss to 0%. So he was able to sell 100% of it as flour. Yeah, I mean, you can't beat that. And I know every grower out there has dealt with this, and they've seen this, and they've either lost a crop or they've done something that wasn't probably uh, fair to the marketplace and still sold it to make their money to cover their costs. And so, and, and we understand that. People are people are trying to, to take care of their families and so forth, so we, we totally get that. That's what's so great about our equipment is you can do that and know that you're providing a safe, effective medicine or, in, in the case of recreational, um, recreational activity for people because our equipment is going to remove those microbial uh, potential pathogens. Uh, as to warranty, um, we provide a full 12-month parts, labor, and travel warranty on our equipment. So should anything go wrong, we will come out there at no cost to the customer to fix the part, the problem. Um, as to how fast we can get out to the customer, we encourage our customers to connect the unit to the Internet. That way, if they have any issues, we can log in remotely almost um, within, if it's during business hours, we can do it within you know, 15, 20 minutes. We can log in and remotely troubleshoot the unit. That way, we don't have to send a technician out to discover what's wrong and then ship, ship parts out. What it allows us to do is once we've identified the problem, we can ship a part out and have our technician meet it there, and we can get that unit back up and running as quickly as possible. Uh, usually within one to two days. Wow. Okay, that's great. Great. Okay. Um, here's a good question. Will this work on oils and extracts? Yes, it will. We have a customer in South Carolina that was having problems with CBD oil. Uh, it, had been, it had become contaminated with salmonella, and he has used it on his CBD oils. Um, the, the thing about our process, as we pointed out, it, it's been a proven process. They've They've irradiated product worldwide, fruits, vegetables, medical devices. Um, it's very predictable, 
And so it doesn't really matter what the product is. As long as um, the x-ray can penetrate through it like it can most products, I mean, if it's a heavy, if, it, if it's a dense titanium product, it's, you know, it's, you'd have to have higher energy to get, to get through it. But for, for flour and oil, it works fantastic for those applications. Okay, great. That's, that's neat. We, cause we, we, did, we didn't really touch on that that much, but it's great to know that it's versatile across all those aspects. That's awesome. Right. Um, and, and one of the other things I'd like to point out along those lines is you could do this in final packaging too. So a lot of our customers, after they've cured and dried their product, they put them into, uh, depending on the lot size, I'll put them into turkey bags, whether they're two-pound turkey bags or five pound, uh, or two pounds into a turkey bag. Um, with our process, you don't have to take any of the product out. So if you wanted to put it into your final packaging, uh, final packaging for processing, you can do it that way and process it that way. That way you don't have to worry about any uh, potential recontamination because we go into some of these facilities where there's a known mold problem and they're treating it with a product that maybe isn't ours, but the tray is open to the, the air. So after they get done treating it, spending all the money to treat it, they pull it out, and now it's become recontaminated again. So when it goes out to the customers, it's sitting on the shelf growing mold and yeast and so if they do something like a secret, uh, secret, secret shopper like more states are starting to do, there's a good chance that they're going to fail again because that mold has been growing on their product. With ours, that doesn't happen. Okay. So once, it's, once you've treated it, then it can't get contaminated again? Is that what you're saying? If you handle it properly, is, uh, you just don't open the bags. Um, as, long as, don't have to be recontam- yeah, as long as they're handled and stored properly, they won't become recontaminated. Okay, great. Um, I think this is a pretty easy question, but I'll ask it anyways. I'm sure you got a good answer for it. If, if someone is growing organically, if they were to use your technology, will they still be able to utilize an organic certification? So, you know, we're working on that. Um, to be honest to me, and I, granted I work for the company, there's nothing more organic than, than light because that's all we're working with is light. But um, whether or not the people who certify agree with us on that uh, it's a different story we need to go find out but um, we don't have an answer for you at that uh, at this time okay the same person has a question and I'm not quite sure I understand it but maybe you'll understand it a little better is any absorption is there any absorption on the flower you, uh, you're talking about radiation I guess so is what I'm assuming that's what he's, he's referencing is there is any absorption of, the, of that radiation on the flower yeah so that's a great question um, yeah, so the, the, there's, no, there's no effect. It, think about it this way. If you go into a room and you turn a light on, um, as soon as you turn the light off, it's, it, it, there's no more light in that room. It's the same thing with x-ray. So just like when you go to the, uh, the dentist and get an x-ray, the, light, the, the photons go through you. They don't stay with you. The same, same thing is true with our equipment. There's no residual. There's no uh, radiation cloud that has to be dispersed. Um, it's, it's a very clean process in that regard. There's nothing on the product um, when, when it's processed. So, no, there's no residual um, x-rays left in the product. Okay. Um, here's, a, here's something. So, foreign matter as related to anything covering the bud that is not organic plant matter. This may have been referring back to his earlier question. i find his other one. Uh, yeah, so how does that foreign matter... The testing the physical mold or mildew is too present. I think we already answered this. He's kind of coming back with another addition. Okay. Disregard that one. Sorry. Sure, no problem. Um, here is one. So microbial DNA is targeted. What about effects on plant DNA? Cannabinoids and terpenes remain unaffected, but any other byproducts from plant material breakdown? We haven't seen anything. No, we haven't seen anything. Yeah, um, you know, we... We have not seen anything, especially in the in the uh, amount of uh, amount of exposure it takes to to actually effectively remediate. Um, it, you know, no change to the plant visually, no change to the plants chemically, um, no texture changes that I'm aware of. Uh, it, it like Nathan said, you put it in and it comes out looking the same. Okay. Um. Okay, I got it. one more question here. Uh, can you put tools in there, like an autoclave or something like that? So in theory you can. Um, it just depends on, on the density. If you're putting in uh, big metal pieces, the, it, it's about penetration, and at these energies you may not be able to get through the, the tools adequately. Um, 
So that that's a, a question that we would have to take a look and see what tools they're referring to. So if they want more information on that, they probably should reach out to us through the through our website at our contact us, and and we can go through that more in detail and tell them what they're capable of doing. The short answer is yes, it should work or it will work. The the long answer is, uh, but there's a lot more to it. Okay. And then here's here's the last final question. We kind of touched on this already. Um, did I lose one of you guys? Justin, you there? Yeah, Justin's here. Okay. Um, here, here's one last one, and we kind of address this, and so we'll kind of reiterate this, but he's asking, what is the per, per kilogram of flower cost add for using this technology? And it's basically, and I'll, help you, I'll let you answer this as well, but it's basically t taking the cost of the machine and whatever your volume of production a year is and dividing it by those numbers will give you your kind of cost to do this. But I'll let you add to that, too, if you have anything, anything you want to add. No, no. Uh, as far as the uh, return on investment, so if it's yeah, return on investment is going to is going to be based on the state and uh, cost of product. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so yeah I figure uh, on the and, volume and, as well. Yeah, exactly. And, and while um, while we're here, I just want to uh, address one thing. When we hired Dustin, because Dustin comes from he he's, he grew his own product and he he comes from the industry. Uh, I'll be honest, he was a little leery working with the product. I don't think he was really sold on it until he actually saw it come out of the unit, opened it up, and he could see it and smell it himself. you want to comment on that just a little bit? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, you know, I came from the end of uh, trying to build out the perfect ideal facility, but uh, really understanding that um, powdery mildew and microbials can come in from, you know, hundreds of different ways, um, whether it's uh, in your medium, whether it's uh, in your... Uh, you know, employees, uh, you know, dirty facility, whatever it may be. So there, there's a lot of different ways um, to get it. So we were always trying to address it on the front end. Um, but uh, I've seen facilities, you know, spend a million dollars to build the ideal perfect clean room, and they're still struggling with powdery mildew. So, um, yeah, when I first saw the equipment, it was, you know, I wanted to see product. I wanted to see uh, how it looked and how it smelled. And, um I was sold when I, I saw some product go through a, a process in um, in Colorado through uh, one of our 420Ms and came out looking exactly the way it went in. Um, so that, that really sold me on the technology for sure. No, no terpene degradation. It didn't lose any of its snap or crisp to the cure or the dry aspect of it as well, and no oxidation from the trichromes and color change at all. No. Not at all. I really, really didn't see it, and you know, um, really understanding the cure process and and what it takes to put that together and and properly do it, and and you know what products should look like after, and having a good understanding of it, um, you know, was pretty important. And and to see this product without any sort of change was uh, impressive for sure. And if I could just add to that, one of the biggest growers in Denver that has one of our units. I was talking with him yesterday, and he told me that they did some independent testing inside their, their facility where they took some uh, processed product and non-processed product and tried to see if they could get their employees to tell the difference, and he said that they could, they, they could not pick which one had been processed versus non-processed. Pepsi challenge. I love it. <laughs> um, as I'm sitting here thinking and I'm looking at this, has anybody offered a toll processor type service going around to facilities or bringing product to them and offering the service to decontaminate so that, you know, you could be a toll processor in a sense? I'm just so kind of spitballing here with that. I, I like that idea. Yeah, we've we've been asked about that repeatedly. Our equipment is um, it's not great for traveling. Once it gets installed, it, it'll run great for years. But okay. it, it it doesn't it's pretty big and heavy in the sense that uh, um, I mean the smallest one obviously is a little smaller you can move around but you're not going to be able to process a large quantity of product for somebody. Yeah. Um, the, the equipment right now is designed to be put on site and 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 not really moved once it's been installed. Understood. Okay. Just thought I'd ask because it just kind of was piquing my interest thinking about that as an option for maybe some of the smaller growers obviously couldn't afford it but uh, they would be able to you know guarantee that. They could pass every time, and so uh, I'll talk to you guys all about this offline as I uh, got some ideas. Um, and is there a way that I could um, look at the technology and see this? I'd love to. Um, you know, I'm in Denver. There's there's a way to 
um, look at this. I'd love to kind of see it firsthand as well so I could stand behind it. I'm really, really curious on the technology. Uh, you see a lot of people that still struggle with PM. Like you said, people spend millions of dollars on putting the best HVAC system, environmental control, clean rooms, dirty zones, all of these things, the bells and whistles, and they still have systemic issues. And so um, I'm really, really fascinated to really look and see and um, understand the, the, the Pepsi challenge, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. We, um, we have a machine in uh, Colorado right now that uh, – we use kind of just as that to prove the technology. Um, so we could definitely get something set up and uh, have you come by and, and look at some product that, that's gone through the system. Well, well guys, um, this has been really neat to learn about your technology. And I've spent a lot of time working in Canada over the last seven years. Um, your radiation is big up there and a few other technologies we've seen come in this space. But this one is super neat. has piqued my interest today learning more about it. And um, just great to see what, what's being pushed into the space and helping evolve our industry. So with that being said, we've kind of gone through all of our questions here, and I'll leave you guys um, the last few minutes here to give any type of um, kind of wrap-up or synopsis or any last comments you want to make to our audience. Yeah, I um, just want to address one thing. You mentioned that you're, you've, you've been up in Canada and you've worked around Gamma. One of the great things about our equipment is that we use about a quarter of the dose they use up there in Canada, which is one of the reasons why our product uh, isn't, or why customers' product isn't as affected as per se as maybe as it would be up in Canada. So that's just a big difference: is that they go up to upwards of a 10,000 gray, whereas we're less than a quarter of that with our with uh, with our customers. Wow, it's a lot safer. Yeah, yep. Yeah. So, um, but that's all I have. I don't know, just uh, Dr. Chernowski, Dustin. I think that's it. Well, um, once again, great to have you all on today. Uh, I appreciate you getting on, Justin, Nathan, and Dustin, um, with Rad Source Technologies. Um, I'm Ellis Smith. I want to thank Cannabis Tech for hosting this today. Um, if you would please tune in, you will see this uh, hosted on our websites here in the next couple of days or week, and you'll be able to watch this and listen to it any time. And thanks for tuning in. See you next time. Have a great day. Thank you.